Hello, this is Tony Heller from RealClimateScience.com, setting the record straight about science. Imagine that you could go back in time six months to the beginning of January. The economy was booming, unemployment was at a record low, the world was preparing for the Olympics, and we were having a great ski season in the United States. Now imagine that somebody at the time came up to you and said, In a few weeks there will be 40 million people unemployed and the Olympics will be canceled. Governments will not allow you to work and people will be hiding in their homes. The only shopping you'll be allowed to do will be at big stores like Walmart. All restaurants and bars will be shut down, as are ski areas and all sporting events. There will be no concerts, museums, or any other form of culture. Government will be telling people to stay home, tracking their every movement, and requiring everybody who goes out of their house to have their face covered. Children in Spain will not be allowed to go out of their house for two months. State governments will be tearing down statues of the Founding Fathers. Cities will be defunding their police departments and allowing police to be attacked. You can't go to church and the only people who are allowed to congregate in large groups are rioters and looters. The airline industry will be nearly out of business and government will be telling people not to shake hands. Governors like Andrew Cuomo will be banning people from visiting their relatives in nursing homes while sending thousands of sick people in to infect those nursing homes leading to tens of thousands of deaths of our senior citizens. And after this happened, the press would be covering up these crimes which were committed by the governors. Nurses in New York City would be reporting massive medical malpractice which was killing thousands of people in their hospitals. If someone had have told this to you back in January, there can be little doubt that you would have thought they were an insane conspiracy theorist. And here we are six months into the year, all those things and a lot more have come to pass. This all started with some completely useless computer models which predicted millions of deaths and was based on code which was so bad the author wouldn't even release it to the public. The people behind all this insanity were completely wrong about their first round of predictions, but they're coming back for a second round now. The old saying goes, fool me once, shame on you, fool me twice, shame on me. Just when we started down the path back towards normality, the alarmists came back with a massive second round of propaganda. 200,000 people to die. Dogs need to socially distance. Fauci says, don't go to Trump rallies. I don't own a television, so I miss all this propaganda. Instead, I look at actual data. Deaths attributed to COVID-19 peaked back in April and have been steadily declining ever since. In a few weeks, we should be down pretty close to zero. This graph shows deaths attributed to COVID-19 in two groups. The light gray is New York and New Jersey, and the dark gray is the rest of the United States. New York and New Jersey sent thousands of sick people to their nursing homes, so they created a huge death count back in April. Most of the deaths in the United States were occurring in just New York and New Jersey. The press, of course, chose to ignore the massive carnage which was being caused by Democratic politicians, instead tried to blame the deaths on President Trump. And now the press tells us that we're having a second surge of COVID-19. But I sure don't see a surge on this graph. Deaths in the United States and most other countries in the world continue to decline steadily. What's happened is, is that the Center for Disease Control has massively increased the amount of testing being done. Most of the new testing is among young people who have very low hospitalization and death rates from COVID-19. But if you massively increase the number of people being tested, you are of course going to also increase the number of cases being reported. What the press doesn't tell you is that an increasing number of cases and a declining number of deaths is very good news, not bad news as the press wants you to believe. More infections and fewer deaths means a lower death rate and that we are headed towards herd immunity. This is the most important graph, which is the daily death rate, which is the number of daily deaths divided by the number of daily new cases. As you can see, the death rate is rapidly declining and is almost as low now as it was back in early March. President Trump and Dr. Birx explained this in a tweet last week. President Trump said, the number of China virus cases goes up because of great testing, while the number of deaths mortality rate goes way down. The fake news doesn't like telling you that. As is normally the case with the fake news corps, they tell us exactly the opposite of what's actually going on. They claim that the reason the death rate was going down was because of the lockdowns, and now that the lockdowns are over, we're going to see a huge increase in deaths again. But there's no valid reason to believe that. Data from Sweden, which never locked down, shows that lockdowns are pointless. 
Sweden never locked down. They never shut down their under 15 schools. They never shut down their restaurants and they refused to step on human rights. The press predicted that Sweden was going to have hundreds of thousands of deaths as a result of the fact that they refused to step on human rights. Rather than focusing on the human rights of citizens living today, the press is very focused on ending the slavery problem from 150 years ago. It is unlikely that the press will ever tell the truth about Sweden. But the number of deaths in Sweden, just like in the United States, peaked in mid-April and is now headed down rapidly towards zero. This despite the fact that they didn't lock down. So the press, instead of just admitting that they were wrong, have launched an all-out propaganda war against Sweden's success. The press over-predicted Sweden's death count by a factor of 20, but of course they don't mention that. Instead, they found a few countries around Sweden which had lower death counts, and they focus on them. Norway, Denmark, and Finland did a better job protecting their nursing homes than Sweden did, and as a result, they had fewer deaths. The press carefully cherry-picked three countries which they could use to make Sweden look bad. Instead of focusing on Bloomberg's cherry-picked data, let's take a look at the larger picture. Bloomberg is based in New York City where they had the highest death rates in the world due to Governor Cuomo sending sick people into nursing homes. This graph shows in red death rates for countries and states which locked down, and over here on the right is Sweden which never locked down. Death rates in New York and New Jersey were more than three times higher than Sweden. Death rates in San Marino, Connecticut, and Massachusetts were more than double the death rates in Sweden. And death rates in Rhode Island, Belgium, the District of Columbia, Louisiana, Andorra, United Kingdom, Michigan, Spain, Italy, Illinois, and Maryland were also higher than in Sweden, which never locked down. Bloomberg, of course, didn't mention any of this because they're delivering propaganda, not news. The purpose of propaganda is, of course, to demoralize, and they don't want the public to know that lockdowns weren't necessary. The man who masterminded Sweden's strategy, Anders Tegnell, recognized from data from Italy that the vast majority of people who were dying were very old and or had comorbidities. So he defined a strategy which is fairly standard for viruses first part is to isolate people at risk. Second part of the strategy was to get the low-risk group exposed so that they could quickly get to herd immunity. The sooner that young people get exposed, the sooner they become immune to the disease, and then they are no longer a threat to the older population. This was the exact opposite of the ridiculous strategy which was done in the United States. In the United States, we sent sick people to nursing homes and tried to keep the young people from getting exposed. All this did was increase the death count and prolong the misery. The man behind Sweden's controversial COVID-19 strategy has characterized lockdowns imposed across much of the globe as a form of madness that flies in the face of what is known about handling viral outbreaks. Anders Tegnell, Sweden's state epidemiologist, said he advised against such restrictions on movement because of the detrimental side effects they often entail. It was as if the world had gone mad and everything we had discussed was forgotten, Tegnell said in a podcast with Swedish Radio on Wednesday. The cases became too many and the political pressure got too strong, and then Sweden stood there rather alone. But the reality is that there shouldn't have been anything controversial about what Sweden did, because they did exactly what's always been done in the past. What should have been controversial was the lockdowns. This was written back in March. The theory of lockdown, after all, is pretty niche, deeply illiberal, and until now untested. It's not Sweden that's conducting a mass experiment, it's everyone else. Sweden did better than lots of countries and states which did lockdown, and Sweden did it without trampling on human rights or destroying their economy. So now let's look at the second wave of massive propaganda which we're currently being hit with. Dr. Fauci ordered lots of new testing, which you can see with these gray bars. If you perform twice as many tests, you would expect to get about twice as many new cases. So looking at the number of new cases, which is what the press loves to do, is extremely deceptive. We're doing more tests, so of course we have more new cases. The more important line is the blue line, which is the percentage of positive COVID-19 tests. You can see that the percentage of positive tests now is about one-third of what it was back in early April. There has been a small increase over the last few weeks, which is mostly due to an increase in testing of young people, who are very unlikely to end up in the hospital or dead. But for Democrats, this is all about political gain, not telling the public the truth. 
Kelly Butler is a Democratic congressional representative from Arizona, and she's, of course, trying to blame everything on the Republican governor. She says Arizona reopened too soon, which is a nonsensical argument, as I'm about to explain. The theory of lockdowns is that they prevented the vast majority of people from being exposed to the disease. If that were true, then the state would be almost as vulnerable now as it was back in March. And as soon as the state opened up, whether it was today, next week, or the week after, they would get a huge surge in the number of cases. The lockdowns were based on the idea of an exponential rise where one person infects two people and they infect four people and they infect eight people and it just gets worse and worse till everybody dies. If that was actually what was going on, whenever you reopen, you would see this exponential rise. All that delaying reopening would do would be to compound the economic misery. And that's exactly what Democrats want. They want economic misery because they think it will help them out in the November election. And being a Democrat, she of course supports the idea of government control over the population, so she wants to require masks. Even though it warrants right on the box, this product is an ear loop mask. This product is not a respirator and will not provide any protection against COVID-19 or other viruses or contaminants. Wearing an ear loop mask does not reduce the risk of contracting any disease or infection. What masks actually do is they collect germs. Then people touch the masks repeatedly, then they touch the produce in the store, and they spread diseases to other people. For Democrats, it's all about politics. They want lots more testing so they can bring the case count up and blame it on the governor. And Democrats want contact tracing because it's another violation of people's privacy. If Kelly Butler was interested in doing things right, she would listen to Sweden's Anders Tegnell. She would know that the only way to move forward is to get the low-risk population exposed and immune to the disease. Everything she's saying is either nonsense or it's counterproductive. And it's all about politics. This graph from CDC shows weekly deaths in Arizona from all causes going back to December 2017. You can see that there's been more deaths in Arizona this year than there was last year, but the peak weeks this year were lower than those from the flu epidemic of 2017-2018. Nobody was talking about shutting down the state during 2018, and odds are that Kelly Butler didn't even know about the flu epidemic of 2018, which had higher peak death rates. Another thing that's interesting about this graph is that you can see that the epidemic probably actually started during December, rather than March, as the experts are trying to claim. The ICU nurses in Nebraska, whom I was hanging out with back in March, said that was exactly what they thought had happened. They said there was a big spike in hospitalization cases with COVID-like symptoms during December and January. Nobody knew what the disease was back then, but it was actually occurring all over the country. And this graph sure makes it look like the epidemic actually started much earlier than the experts are saying. Dr. Fauci has been bragging about his big increase in testing. More testing means more new cases, and more new cases means lots more propaganda from Twitter and everywhere else. Twitter says, the U.S. breaks its national record for the highest number of new COVID-19 cases in a single day. When you do a record number of tests, it's quite likely that you're also going to get a record number of cases. It doesn't mean that the epidemic's getting worse, but it does mean that the propaganda is, of course, going to go off scale. The key metrics are the number of deaths and the death rate, which are both going down. This is exactly what President Trump and Dr. Birx explain, but the press chooses to ignore it because they're doing propaganda, not news. And the press also chooses to ignore the fact that lockdowns have been shown to be totally unnecessary and extremely destructive. Countries like Sweden, Belarus, Japan, and Taiwan never lock down, and they're doing just fine. Kids in Sweden never left school. Their universities are open and their restaurants are open. They didn't violate human rights and they did much less damage to their economy than the United States did. Another very important factor for understanding what's going on is looking at who's being tested. You can see from this data in Arizona that the vast majority of COVID-19 confirmed cases are in the age group of 20 to 44 years. But if we look at who's dying from the disease, we can see that they're almost all over 65 years old. Very few people in the 20 to 44 age group die from this disease, which means that a large number of new cases in that age group is not likely to lead to a surge in the number of deaths. Now let's look at some more propaganda from Bloomberg. They say, America's scary COVID-19 curve has a simple explanation. But the American curve isn't scary at all. We're headed down with death rates getting closer to zero. 
And here's the scary curve which Bloomberg is talking about. They show that the number of new cases in the United States is increasing, whereas the number of new cases in the EU is not. Bloomberg wants people to believe that somehow Europe is managing the virus better than the United States is. But what this graph is really showing us is that we're doing a lot of new testing in the United States and that the European Union is probably already close to herd immunity. Europe has very high population density, so it's likely that a large number of people were exposed to the disease earlier in the year. If we think back to the scary exponential curve which experts were showing us back in March, that would be happening right now in Europe if there was still a large number of vulnerable people. The fact that they're not seeing a rise in cases in Europe shows that the lockdowns probably did not work. All of the assumptions which Bloomberg is making are probably wrong. Bloomberg believes that the lockdowns worked, and they also seem to believe that the virus has somehow magically changed its properties. Bloomberg seems to believe that there's some magical amount of time which you need to keep your economy shut down for, and if you do that, the virus will leave you alone. There is no scientific basis to that sort of thinking. Nothing that Bloomberg's saying makes any sense scientifically, but their propaganda just gets worse. Next up, they blame the increase in infections on mom-and-pop restaurants. Government experts tell us that you can get infected in a small business, but not in a large business like Walmart. And experts say that you can't go to church because church is much too dangerous. The press tells us that small mom-and-pop businesses like restaurants are spreading infections, but not huge crowds of looters, rioters, and protesters. The Washington Post also tells us that Sean Hannity and Tucker Carlson are responsible for the epidemic, but certainly not the Democratic governors who sent huge numbers of sick people into nursing homes and killed tens of thousands of people. As I mentioned earlier, the press is trying to cover up what happened in New York, New Jersey, Michigan, and other Democratic-governed states, and instead blame the problem on Florida and Texas. But if we look at the actual statistics, we can see that deaths in Republican-governed Arizona, Florida, and Texas are much, much lower than they were in New Jersey, New York, Connecticut, and Massachusetts. So, of course, the press doesn't want to talk about that. And Governor Cuomo of New York, who created the largest death count in the world, has also been criticizing Texas. Texas has the 10th lowest death rate in the country, and it's 120th of Andrew Cuomo's New York. Texas also has a lower death rate than Denmark, and if you remember a few minutes ago, the press was holding up Denmark as a model of success. It's all propaganda all the time from the press, and they do everything they can to avoid having the public find out what's actually going on. The reality is that Texas is not having a problem. The press has focused their attention on the Texas Medical Center in Houston, which is right across the street from where I went to graduate school at Rice University. The hospital says that only 28% of their ICU patients are being treated for COVID-19, they can handle the situation just fine, and that it's perfectly normal to have ICU capacities that run in the 80s and 90s. That's how all hospitals operate. If the public knew that, it would be much more difficult for the press to create panic, which is, of course, their goal. BuzzFeed News tells us that the huge crowds of looters, rioters, and protesters did not spread the infection, apparently because they believe the virus respects social justice warriors, looters, and rioters. But as is almost always the case, BuzzFeed News is lying. The protesters did spread the virus among the police force in Memphis, and some hospital workers in Memphis say that many of the sick people coming into the hospital told them that they had attended the protests. The New York Times predicted 2 million American deaths from COVID-19. The purpose of this sort of propaganda was to raise hysteria and get the country to lock down. The country fell for this insanity, and now we have 40 million people out of work. And in a few weeks, their benefits are going to run out, and they're likely to get evicted from their homes. This has the potential for being a massive crisis in the United States, unlike anything we've seen in a very long time. But the press doesn't want people thinking about that. Instead, they have everyone focused on a fake second wave and trying to solve the problems of slavery, which ended 150 years ago. The reality is that about 100,000 Americans die from infections they contracted in the hospital every year. It's very likely that the large majority of deaths which occurred from COVID-19 in the United States were contracted either in nursing homes or in hospitals. Another dirty little secret is that almost half a million Americans die every year from medical malpractice. And we know from the nurses' reports that many of the deaths which occurred in New York City hospitals were directly due to medical malpractice. 
propagandists have driven the country insane with misdirection. Even my congressional representative here in Wyoming, Liz Cheney, is telling everybody to wear a mask. If we had a science-based approach like Sweden, we would be focused on getting to herd immunity rather than constantly obsessing about slowing down the spread of the infection. Maybe Dick Cheney needs a mask, but survival rates for healthy people under the age of 65 are 99.8%. That's about the same death rate as for the flu, and we don't shut down the country and put 40 million people out of work every year over the flu. We need to focus on the real problems facing America, and there are some very serious ones coming up in the near future. Young people running around wearing masks and tearing down statues is not helping anything. Very few things which have happened this year make any sense. And as I mentioned at the beginning of the video, had anyone described to you in January what was going to happen in 2020, you would have laughed at them and thought they were a total nutcase. Toto's best guess is that the propaganda and insanity is just going to continue to get worse ahead of the November election. Toto is pretty good at sniffing these things out. Visit him on the web at realclimatescience.com. He's been pulling back the curtain on junk science and propaganda for a long time.